Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Schmidt House podcast. I'm your host, Zach Schmidt. I have some current events that I wanted to comment on. So this episode, I'm going to talk about the war in Ukraine, gas prices, CBC reporter backlash for questioning Trudeau, trucker protest leader Tamara Lynch is released on bail, and Justin Trudeau's April 1st pay raise. If you haven't already, head over to my Rumble page and subscribe there as I post exclusive content there that I call Shorts. For sources for the topics that I have talked about this episode, check out the description box. Now let's talk some current events. Okay, so for the first topic for today is the war in Ukraine. So I'm pretty sure everybody kind of has at least a little bit of an idea of what's going on here because it's been all over the news. COVID pretty much miraculously disappeared from the daily news cycle pretty much overnight, the second that uh, Trudeau kicked the truckers out of Ottawa, the script just completely flipped to be talking about the Ukraine-Russia conflict. So uh, I'm, I'm just acting upon this, something that you guys know what's going on. This is something that I've been a little bit hesitant to comment on um, for the most part because it's not that it's a controversial topic. It's obviously had the same polarizing effect that we've seen covid take, whether you're pro-mandate or anti-mandate or whatever the case may be. But the reason I didn't want to comment on it up until this point was because I just simply don't trust anything that the media, whether it's social media or mainstream, anything like that has been putting forward. Um, what and I don't th- believe anything is true coming out of Russia or Ukraine. So without me being able to verify things like that, it really just puts me in a position where I don't want to say something that or put something out there that I can't really verify. And the reason I can't really verify that is because there is so much false information out there, lots of false sources, an incredible amount of propaganda not just coming from Ukraine and Russia, but from our Canadian government as well. So that's why I've kind of held off a little bit about talking about it for the main point. I mean, there's been tons of information coming from the Ukrainian side that used either, you know, stills from movies or even video game clips and just tons of other stuff. And the biggest point that I kind of want to point at our own media on is the fact that this the whole covid narrative over the last two years whether you're for or against it doesn't really matter but from my perspective we were lied to over the last two years and an incredible amount and you even see things come out recently pertaining to the pfizer quote-unquote vaccine And it just kind of confirms that like everything that our mainstream media, our governments, all of that stuff have been pushing have been absolute lies. And for the COVID topic to just pretty much disappear from the news cycle and then all of a sudden Ukraine, Russia pops up, it just kind of had a little red flag pop up where I was just like, I don't believe any of it. The people that lied for the last two years are now telling the truth about this thing. Plus you look into other things pertaining to the subject like Nancy Pelosi or um, Joe Biden and his son Hunter, Hillary Clinton, lots of these uh, people that were screaming Russia is the enemy for the last two years or for the since 2016 and lying about Trump about it are now coming on and saying that, you know, we need to defend Russia or defend Ukraine against Russia. And it's clear that these people have a a vested interest in some of the things that are going on in the Ukraine. Now, there's also been tons of report about biolabs and even United States funded biolabs that Putin is apparently supposed to be targeting and stuff like that. So there's just an absolute just point of untrustworthiness to where I don't want to choose a side in this. I really don't think Canada should be involved by any means. And I think we just came up with another 50 million of resources that we're sending over there. Like my tax dollars shouldn't be going over to that conflict, right? Um, If things got worse, 
and and you know their actual truths came out but at this point i just assume that that everything's lies so my biggest question about it all is if putin is actually the bad guy um He's obviously taken a pretty hard stance against NATO and the United States and and all of those allies. And I guarantee you that this would not have happened under Trump. Trump would have not let this happen. Um, and it's only because the weakness of uh, let's go Brandon, Joe Biden, that he's actually willing to start the conflict. So I think he is seeking out information and, um, you know, certain resources that Joe Biden specifically uh, has admitted to uh, having a hand in, in, in their politics there back when he was the vice president. And I think that Putin is, is really putting the pressure on that way. And everybody in kind of like the, the globalist elitist party or that camp is basically freaking out and trying to smear Putin, smear Russia, and all this stuff. And it's really making it, it's making us look just so incredibly silly. Like, when we're having all of these companies, you know, pull their business and, and pull their operations and all of this stuff, and like, smearing your average everyday citizens, like you, you'll have Canadian and American, or Russian, Russian people that immigrated to Canada or the United States, they might have businesses or even just locally, they're getting absolutely smeared um, over this conflict. And it's like these people have absolutely nothing to do with it. We are absolutely vilifying a section of the population yet again um, for nothing. We've learned nothing from COVID, from creating this division. And it's all just spun by the media. And you have all these blue checks that have now taken their, these NPCs have taken their uh, triple vax emojis out of their Twitter profiles and have tossed up a Ukraine flag. You know, it's just the, the level, level of virtue signaling is just gross. And it it's, it's disgusting to see. So you have um, businesses such as McDonald's, Visa, MasterCard, Coke, Pepsi, uh, the whole Swift payment system, which is basically the entire corporate banking system in Russia, Netflix, Apple, Disney, Starbucks, the list goes on. All these companies are pulling their um, their support in Russia. I've heard that, like, for example, Disney, or sorry, uh, McDonald's and Starbucks, they're going to still continue to, the, to pay their employees there, but they're just not going to have any operations there. They're just going to completely stop it until this conflict is over or indefinitely. I, I don't know how it's all going to play out. But you know, we see even locally that pretty much every province, uh, provincial legislature, municipal, um, and obviously our federal one have, sided with Ukraine, which whatever, if that's the way they go, but they're doing it from such a disingenuous place, you know, even forcing companies and, and, and the, you know, SLGA here in Saskatchewan to pull Russian vodka from their shelves. And it's even prompting, prompting people to pour existing vodka that they bought down the drain uh, in solidarity, you know, even Smirnoff Vodka, which is pretty much an American vodka company nowadays, uh, just so that they can virtue signal and get that online clout. Um, it's these virtue signalers that it almost, when you're virtue signaling, in my mind, it proves that you have the lack of the ability to critically think because you're just going on with whatever is going to get you the most clicks that day. And it's it's honestly disgusting that society is continuing to push towards that. So uh, Trudeau, of course, is in Europe showing his supports for Ukraine, uh, going to different countries and doing a whole tour of him of trying to show how awesome he is to the world. But realistically, he's just being booed. He was booed on the streets of England, um, you know, and, and means and meanwhile at home uh, in Ottawa, it's illegal to have flags that say F Trudeau on them, which is technically, a, a, you know, a protected uh, chartered right is to be able to have criticism of your government, but Trudeau is above that. But while he's in England, he's getting this, people on the street say the exact same thing to him. Many European news anchors are um, taking the the low hanging fruit um, <laughs> of making fun of him. You know, uh, I heard people calling him a plank. I'm not too sure that what that means. 
um, but mostly picking him apart for not know, not being able to answer a simple question, as we in Canada have seen for an incredibly long time. But um, it's just funny now that he's kind of in this more of a uh, international stage that he's just getting ripped to shreds there. Like this guy is completely inept and unable to actually be a good diplomat or a, a leader of a country. So, um, the thing that the biggest bone, bone that I have to pick with him is that he's over there saying that he's standing up for democracy and all of these things about authoritarianism and stuff like that. And it's like, you literally took the role of a tyrant, not even a month ago, in your own, uh, country. So it's his, um, his hypocritical, um, actions is just, it's annoying to every single time I see him, um, you know, in a news interview or whatever, it just drives me absolutely mental. So one last point on this topic is, um, Alex Jones, there's a video circulating of him predicting that there's going to be some type of major conflict in February of 2022, and he predicted that on October 20, uh, 21st, 2021. So just another example of how Alex Jones is right. All right, next topic is gas prices. Now, I'm going to try to skip over some of this stuff. Um, I could talk about this a little bit more, but I'm just going to go a little bit quick. So um, obviously, uh, you drive a vehicle, right? Uh, you've been filling up your gas tank. You've noticed that it's just getting creeping up, creeping up, creeping up. Um, this is largely to do with lots of the um, international trade, specifically that is done with Russia, Saudi Arabia, um, and Canada's lack of domestically sourced uh, oil products. So you can thank a liberal voter for that one. Um, cause it's basically been everything that's been priming over the last, uh, almost six years of Justin Trudeau's rule over, uh, Canada and the efforts that he's been taking to essentially bankrupt our energy sector. So, um, the one thing I am going to comment on from an economic perspective about the gas prices is that lots of people don't understand this, but there's a principle in economics called price elasticity of demand. And that's basically saying the um, the ability of the demand to shift when there's a price change in the uh, in the marketplace, essentially. So when you have um, external forces impacting essentially um, a single good, how does the price reflect that? And gasoline is typically viewed as one of the very few perfectly inelastic, um, inelastic demand curves of, um, of a good. And what that means is that if there is a shift in supply, uh, that will determine the price significantly quicker than a shift in the demand because demand for gasoline and it's, or essentially oil byproducts are essentially just, uh, constantly there. All right. So the problem with that is, is having a supply that dictates, dictates the price is that the price setters in the market can influence that, uh, significantly quicker than the consumers have to be able to respond to said increases in prices, which is a problem with something that you're using, such as a staple as gasoline, having to drive your vehicles for, you know, to get to work or get to a job site or anything like that. So it being perfectly inelastic, the consumers don't really have any sort of say uh, by making consumer cho choices in the market as gonna as it's gonna impact the price of the product. Okay, it's completely done on the supply side. So the problem with that specifically in Canada is the fact that we don't have Alberta and Saskatchewan's uh, oil rigs just running twenty four seven here. Uh, we've had large constraints specifically since um, Biden got elected and Trudeau's weak leadership in canceling the Keystone Pipeline, which would have brought a lot of jobs and obviously a lot of the resources to Canada. So with that being canceled, that's one thing. Um, the other thing, too, is the uh, amount of taxes that you actually pay. So if you look at the pump and you're looking at the price, typically about 50% of that 
is taxes. The actual price of what you're paying for the gasoline is about half of that. So if you're looking at gas being, you know, in some places $2 per liter, the real cost of the gasoline is only a dollar. And that includes the profits for that, that pump or that gas station and that company. Uh, the rest of it, so essentially a dollar would go to the company supplying it, a dollar would go to the government. Um, you know, we're seeing car um, carbon tax going to jump up April 1st. That should be another between 9 and 11 cents per liter that it's just going to go straight to the government. So um, Canada is heavily taxed and it's it's starting to hurt us. But Jason Kenney has had the brilliant idea of removing the tax on gasoline and it sounds good in theory. Um, you know, he's saying that it's going to save. Um, so let me pull up here. Yeah, so Jason Kenney says that the estimated savings to Albertans on the fuel tax will be worth approximately $1.3 billion. So he's all he's doing is removing the 13 cents per liter that the Alberta government charges. So that's all fine in theory. And governments have a very good way of being able to, you know, remove taxes in one place, but then hit you harder in another. And that's exactly what's going to happen, uh, in my opinion here. And um, people around Saskatchewan have been um, calling on Scott Moe to do something similar. But ultimately, lots of the things that the tax on gasoline pays for is your roads and road maintenance. Um, I know in Saskatchewan, we have arguably the worst highways and the infrastructure that way. We've wasted an incredible amount of money and done some had some bad decisions as of late. Uh, but Alberta, I've always prided, I've been um, proud of whenever I go there. It's like, man, Alberta always has good roads. So what you're going to see is either that, what was it, $1.3 billion in tax revenue from the gasoline sales, that's going to be have that's going to have to be made up someplace else, or your infrastructure will suffer because again, the the tax on gasoline pretty much essentially just goes to cover or to fund lots of those um, infrastructure projects such as roads. So, I don't really think that's a big idea. It's a it's a band aid on a bullet bullet hole in my opinion. Uh, it'll end up costing more long run. So. I mean, what can you do? I would rather see Scott Moe and Jason Kenney get tough on Ottawa and remove the carbon tax entirely because that's actually costing Canadians significantly more. Um, you know, I don't expect Trudeau to actually make a smart decision about repealing the carbon tax uh, right now, which would be the, the smartest decision to do. But uh, hey, um, that's what happens when you elect liberal policies. Um, but you even have people like Elon Musk tweeting... Um, you know, Elon Musk, uh, you know, CEO of, um, of Tesla, electric car company. He even has tweeted out on March 4th that he says, hate to say it, but we need to increase oil and gas output immediately. Extraordinary times demand extraordinary measures. Basically saying that we're not at a spot where we have the ability to, to run everything on uh, green energy, you know. So the largest electric car company in the world, the CEO of that company is saying that we need oil and gas and we're not having any type of leaders actually step up. And if you see that lots of, uh, you know, media personalities such as Stephen Colbert saying that he'd pay as high as $15 uh, per gallon for, for gasoline because he drives a Tesla. Well, that's basically saying, Hey, uh, to have a clean conscience, um, get ready for all time high gas prices of over $4 a gallon, you know, uh, to help because, because they're reducing the imports on Russian oil. Well, he's basically just shaming for people for being poor. You know, he's saying, I don't care what the price goes up on gas. I drive a Tesla, you know, not to mention that all of the oil and gas products, um, pay for, um, the electricity and stuff like that. The level of arrogance from these people is just absolutely embarrassing. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that for that topic. All right. So the woke mob, uh, specifically on Twitter, but, uh, not exclusively to it, 
has been criticizing a CBC News reporter, Travis, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, but Don Raj, uh, who's a senior parliamentary reporter for the CBC. And he's been criticized because he's in Europe right now. And he posed the question a couple of days ago to uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Greasy Hair Freeland, uh, whose grandfather was a, an actual Nazi. Uh, and she has recently posed with a pro-Ukrainian Nazi banner while protest- protesting for uh, for Ukraine in Toronto. Uh, she and her uh, underling, the Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie, who has been uh, proven to be just as condescending as that smelly troll deputy PM that we have. But Travis asked a very simple question, uh, which is actually kind of out of character for someone someone from the CBC. Uh, but it's what many of us were thinking, at least I have been. Uh, and the question being asked was along the lines of, uh, why is Trudeau in Europe on the taxpayer's dime using this opportunity as a photo op? I think that's a very fair question because that seems to be the, what is actually going on. Um, but he continues to state that there's issues at home needing to be solved and the exchanges needing to be made in Europe could be done from Canada. Again, completely fair question, but this reporter is getting backlash from the left, and it's kind of funny because he's actually getting support from people on the right saying, finally, someone's asking a good question to these corrupt politicians. But, I mean, we have um, at least four major Canadian diplomats there right now, and they're over there on our tax dollars basically doing these photo ops. Um, there is actually a... Um, Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun uh, reported on it, but um, I'm not a huge fan of his, but I'll, I'll link the article. But there are seven different um, photo ops scheduled. And it's very frustrating because you can tell the vanity of Trudeau by what he's doing there specifically. He is there to, to basically try to put Canada on the stage and and make us look good for a conflict that I don't think that we have any business in being in, but he's going over there to, you know, meet with his other buddies at the world economic forum and talk about how they're basically going to back Ukraine to try to take down Russia. Now, again, not to kind of get back on this topic, but you can just really tell that I think Trudeau's out of his element uh, I mean, he's not a good politician by any means. And when he's over there doing what he does best, uh, which is making a fool of himself when he's not dressing in blackface, but he just is completely out of his element there. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's literally April 1st, he's going to take a bunch of firearms from legal gun owners in Canada and right now he's literally arming um, Ukrainian rebels, or well, sorry, I shouldn't say rebels, Ukrainian civilians with fully automatic weapons, the weapons that he so vilifies. He is personally cashing checks for the Ukrainian government to be able to get those weapons in the hands of civilians. The level of hypocr- hypocrisy is just embarrassing, and I'm absolutely sick of it. To to see how he behaves both domestically and internationally. Like, I don't know how many more times I can say, like, we can't elect these liberal politicians. I don't think the conservatives are good by any means. I think the entire House of Commons needs to be gutted. But, I mean, the man is without account- uh, without any accountability at all. You know, he's been through scandal after scandal here. And now he has his state-funded, bought-and-paid-for CBC News, and they actually ask a a legitimate question, and then they get raked over the coals for it. Um, You know, Christian Freelander, in her condescending way, um, cussed this guy out too. It's It's just ridiculous. The entire Liberal Party is corrupt to the core. And these people are not good people and they shouldn't be leading our country. So please, 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 if you are voting liberal, NDP, or even conservative, please start getting a little bit more politically active and understand 
who these people are, what they represent, and who you are voting for when you go and check that ballot box. Because, because it's it's more important now than ever. If we're going to play by this system and and you know, I I would gladly see this system completely collapse and fold in upon itself. That would, uh, that would make me incredibly happy. But if we're actually going to have some semblance of what has been done in the past and the systems that we have currently in place, if we're going to continue down that road, we need to make better decisions. All right, so next topic is uh, Tamara Lynch being released on bail. So if you don't know who Tamara Lynch is, she is one of the leaders of the Freedom Convoy that spent almost a month in Ottawa before being kicked out by uh, Trudeau's goons and the Emergencies Act being invoked and that level of uh, tyranny. Anyway, so she was arrested pretty much right at the start. Um, we had uh, one of the other leaders, um, BJ. Uh, he turned tail really quick and got out of there. Um, I think he was kind of a plant, if you if you ask me, but Tamara seemed to be kind of the linchpin that was, uh, no pun intended, uh, the linchpin that kind of held the entire thing together. Um, she was, uh, to my knowledge, the person that actually started the structure of it. Um, and I have kind of my own little criticisms of um, the way that things went down from the truckers side. Um, but obviously having her in jail um, under the charges of mischief, which is basically a nothing charge. Um, she was held there for, uh, I think, I think almost three weeks. It was like 18 days or something like that. Um, she was held, uh, on those charges. Um, lawyers were working hard to, to be able to get her out. Um, so she's finally released on bail after being denied initially. Um, the bail conditions was that she needed to basically leave Ottawa immediately, um, had to leave. Ontario immediately and was not allowed to be able to go and do anything affiliated with this protest. And I think one of the other conditions of her bail was that she wasn't allowed to be associated with any other protests. Now, I think this is a severe overstep of her chartered rights, and it should be, you know, the writings on the wall for this one for anybody that's looking to be involved. Like, I guarantee her bank account is still seized. I guarantee she's on the the RCMP are going to watch her for probably the rest of her life. Like we have certain structures that we said that the government was not supposed to be able to, you know, invoke on. And it seems that they just really don't care. Um, they'll violate our chartered rights, even though like what our chartered rights are, are rules of what the government cannot do to you and is supposed to uphold and protect. That means the cops, the bureaucrats, the elected officials, all of it, are supposed to protect your chartered rights. And specifically in the last two years, none of that has been happening. And what you saw in Ottawa is a complete symptom of that problem. So I'm glad that Tamara's out. Um, I think there's still a lot to do on the trucker front. It's been awfully quiet, not a lot of support. It's like, I think lots of people, once the Emergency Act uh, came into play, a lot of people got... Um, afraid to kind of to kind of keep rolling with it particularly because they can seize all of your assets right uh you can't do bank you can't do any banking so you can't buy food you can't do this can't do that um i know that's something that i've taken a look at my personal finances and um looked at things differently since then um just knowing that the way that they the government could essentially take it all from you on a whim um, so that's an incredibly big problem and, um, her being out, I think it just does kind of give a little bit of strength to the people there. Um, she had the most trumped up charges of anybody that they actually did arrest during that period. And they wanted to make, uh, you know, example out of her. I really do hope that they're the people that were involved with the, the tyranny, come you know it, they get their day just kind of keeping it simple that way because if we're going to have a Canada of the future we need to be able to keep the people that violate the violate our rights they need to be held to account that means judges the politicians the cops bureaucrats like 
anybody that had their hands in that pot should be held liable. Um, and that's not just for Tamara, but for so many other people as well. Um, um, my fear of all of this, and, and it's something that I kind of feared from the start, was that things of this nature are just going to get more frequent and and worse. So I think that if you're not aware of the truth of what happened in Ottawa, um, it's something that I think you really need to, to look at. I know it's pretty much disappeared from the news cycle since the Ukraine thing. But it's something that you should really understand a lot more. Specifically, if you are the type of person that just watches mainstream media, because there is so much that was going on in other spaces that you would never, ever see the truth from. Um, you know, there's still there's still truckers that are in uh, the Ottawa area, um, you know, still holding strong and all of that stuff. But it's just not not on the forefront. These people still do need our support because their goal of what they wanted to, you know, the conversation that they want to had that Trudeau ran and hid from never took place. And I think it still needs to because unvaccinated people are not, a lot, you know, they're able to leave the country, but it is surely not easy to travel. And one of the chartered rights is being able to enter and leave Canada. So there's still a long way to go. And I think that, uh, we need to start having conversations around that. And, you know, my whole thing is, is that, you know, there's conservative leadership um, race that's going to be starting. So while the conservatives pick a new leader, um, we just need to be smarter about who we're actually putting in and pay attention to what's going on. Because uh, if, if you think the conservatives uh, getting in is going to change things, uh, you're gravely mistaken. Uh, they are the exact same thing as the liberals. So do your research before, or do your research while these events are going on and it's popular in the news uh, because it's very important to keep your, your finger on the pulse of lots of these things because it's going to have a spillover effect into lots of areas of our culture and specifically politics when you're seeing lots of these elections uh, coming coming up and stuff like that. And, you know, you could have a, the next federal election is going to be a dogfight, but it's going to be the, the major decisions are not going to come on election day. The major decisions are going to become coming from people that are actually on the ground during the, the trucker protest, um, you know, doing their research about things in Ukraine, understanding what their rights are and things like that. So um, I'm really urging people to get politically active. All right, and the last topic today, Trudeau is giving himself a pay raise. So Trudeau has found yet another useless excuse to waste tax dollars, this one in the form of another pay increase for his parliament. So while the plebs starve, he gets more money in his bank account off of our labor. Uh, I do believe this is his third pay increase since the start of covid and uh, he and none of his friends, or he and all of his friends never lost a penny of income during the time that many businesses and families were struggling during COVID. Um, the, the more I talk about him, it just hurts my head. He frustrates me. Um, this will bring an increase to uh, him personally, his increase will be $21,000 to that of uh, this time two years ago. And what are we getting for this increase? Well, it sure isn't uh, more accountability for him and the rest of the House of Commons. Um, it's not them actually showing up to work. Uh, you know, they, they get paid regardless whether they show up or not, which, you know, they took a long break or after the election, kind of even around election time. They haven't really truly been to work in the last eight months. You know, a couple weeks here and there. They took extended time over Christmas. They took some time off um, leading up to when the truckers were showing up. It, it's just absolutely embarrassing the the amount of work that does not get done by the elected officials. And there's, they're making a, sh a, a ton of money all on our tax dollars. Like, we need to have a disruption to the system here, guys. But um, we have more taxes. We have more inflation. 
Uh, it's specifically easy to notice with record high gas prices. All while he gets to take a trip to Europe and grandstand and gallivant and do this whole horse and pony show, uh, showcasing the to the entire world of how virtuous he is, but mostly of how much of an, an inept idiot that he is. Uh, check out comedian Andrew Schultz. He made fun of Trudeau at his most recent shop, uh, stop in Toronto. It was quite funny. I watched it like three or four times on repeat. It's really short. I'll link it in the description box because it's, it's hilarious. But the thing that when I watched that clip, it was kind of funny because I'm like, the whole crowd is obviously not a fan of Trudeau and it's in Toronto, which is like liberal central. But it really made me think that he might not have actually won his elections. The, his amount of unpopularity is just ridiculous. And it seems that if he didn't legitimately rig it, I know there's the the missing mail-in votes and all of that stuff, but that's not a huge number where I think it has a, a statistically significant chance of changing anything. But still, that's if we're going to you know subscribe to this system, it, those votes needed to be checked. But um, the fact that maybe he is he's playing a very specific game and making sure that um, certain ridings are won and and completely gaming it rather than actually rigging it, which technically is not illegal, but it's just it's just scummy. We need complete electoral reform in Canada because we're in trouble if we don't. But please do not vote for Trudeau or any of his cronies. That's Jagmeet Singh. The Conservative Party, the Greens, they're all bad. Um, I'm not going to make a PPC plug here, but just really, uh, like, I want you to find an issue that you believe in because there's pro there probably has been a bill in the last um, six years that you might be surprised of the way that people voted for it. You know, um, say what you want about the trans issue, but all of the conservatives voted for Bill C-4. You know, these people aren't in the interest of your morals and principles um, on whatever side of the aisle as it currently stands in the House of Commons. But Canada really cannot uh, afford any of this arrogance anymore. We need to be more aware of what's going on we need to be more aware of who is doing what because i don't want to lose canada and, and i'm sure many other people don't but if we're not willing to actually take a stand and make a difference whether it is at a local level i fear we're just going to lose the country that we all love Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed some of the stuff that I was talking about. Please head over to Rumble if you haven't already and subscribe on there because I do post exclusive content that I call shorts. Um, it's just a, a more condensed version of, of some of these topics. Um, I usually I only stick to a single topic um, and I try to make them short, but I end up being a little bit long-winded, so I apologize for that. Um, I do want to try to get them under that 10-minute mark just so it's a little bit easier to listen. Please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And really, the, the best way to do that is copy and paste the URL uh, of this podcast to a friend. That's going to be a huge help to me, but it's also kind of going to be able to maybe shed a little bit of light on some topics that you might not have heard about. Um, that's kind of why I do these current events. It's just things that are on the forefront of my mind on some things that have happened recently. Um, that, you know, might have missed the news cycle or we're just a little bit too much going on uh, for you to kind of pick up on it uh, because I, I know there's tons and tons of content to consume. So the fact that you're even listening to me right now, a uh, huge thank you for that. But um, yes, thank you for listening to this episode. Trudeau is a plank. Dos Vidanya. Stay free. Thank you for listening to the Schmidt House podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so by sending Bitcoin. The wallet address is in the description box below. I would really appreciate it as I try to keep the podcast ad free and it helps me cover production costs. The Schmidt House podcast is available on the following services, YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. 
please like, share, and subscribe, and, en- and enable the notifications. But most importantly, share this podcast with a friend by copying the link and sending it to them personally. Check out the description box for more information about things I discussed on this episode and how to get in contact with me. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or suggestions that you may have, including topics that you would like to hear me discuss. Take it easy and have a good day.